Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit ibethel.org. Let me tell you what I'm going to do with that. I, uh, I've got a one-point message. One point, that's all. And so it won't take me long to get there, so I'm going to stall. I'm going to stall and just kind of make up some stuff so that I actually make it look more like an actual message. But uh, I, actually, I really do. I really have just a, a one-point message I'm going to share with you. But let me, share, let me give you the context of the message, and then I'll give you the context of the Scripture, which we'll read in a few minutes. <clears throat> Christmas is, a, is, a, is, is an amazing season. It's a fun season. It's uh, probably 90% of the people in here think it's the most fun time of the year. But for those who don't, there's always really good reason because it's a reminder of loss. It's a reminder of maybe a failure, maybe a risk taken that didn't work. It could be any number of things. But we always we always walk with people through this season that that uh, that rejoice with those who are rejoicing, but they're not rejoicing themselves. And if that makes sense, and I I uh, I don't think we have to tolerate that. I, I, to be honest, I feel like I feel like the Lord wants to bring breakthrough to every single household. And I I I, I we we read this offering reading. You know, it's it, how, how many of you could probably say it backwards? You know, we've been doing it for so many years. We have a few guests. We have four different readings. I think it's four, four or five, something like that that we that we read on a regular basis. But that particular one, as simple as it is, it's, uh, it's so important for me because I, I don't want any unemployment. Anyone who wants a job who's a part of this house, you know, I, I want you working. I want, I want the simple things. It's not okay with me. We, we can't say, well, it's just one of those tests from the Lord. No, he can use it, but he didn't design it. There's a lot of stuff he can use that he doesn't design. And, uh, and so we've got to stop creating in our theology room for things that aren't in heaven. He has intended for things to, to be fluid and life-giving and carrying breakthrough and purpose and everything that's done. We were designed that way. And when it's not that way, it doesn't mean we did something wrong. It doesn't mean that that, you know, somehow the great sin entered the house or something. What it means is we haven't arrived yet and we're just, we're learning. We're learning how to apprehend all that God has promised. And in the process of apprehending, how many of you know we are becoming, we are becoming someone, something that can contain the fullness of what God is saying and doing. I, I've had some things on my heart and mind. Actually, what I'm going to share today, my, my one point message. Yay! Those of you that want to get out early, you, you, you have reason to rejoice, you know. Um, the, I, I've actually, I've had this, this particular word, this theme on my heart for the last uh, probably five or six weeks, and I've shared it actually in a few small settings. And my, my thinking is this, God looks at stuff way different than we do. How many of you knew that one already? He looks at stuff way different than, he doesn't get nervous at all. He, uh, he, he's, draw, he's attracted to things. And this, this is really is what caught me off guard this week in my thinking. He's attracted to stuff. He's attracted to weakness. It says, in weakness, he's made strong. That's what the scripture says. He's actually attracted to weakness. He actually, it, it doesn't mean he, he repels strength. It just means he's drawn to weak people. It's, it's such an important theme of his that he told the prophet Joel in chapter 3, verse 10. He says, tell the people, those who are weak, tell the weak to say, I am strong. Let them be saying what I'm doing. Let their words make agreement with what I have purposed to do in my heart so that heaven meets earth once again. He's attracted to weakness. He's attracted to, well, here's a weird one. The scripture says, those who are poor financially those who are poor are strong in faith. It doesn't mean you have to be broke to have faith. It just means you don't have distractions. Remember, Jesus in Matthew 13 talked about the deceitfulness of riches. 
It's not that money and faith can't coexist. It's just that if your heart's not in a right place, there's so many things that can pull you away from the very source of faith, which is the word of God. It's the very word that he breathes into our life. And so here we've got this strange verse that I, I believe it's in James, if I remember right, about those who are, who, who are just financially struggling, struggling. Those who are poor are actually strong in faith. So what's the point? God is attracted to need and he brings faith where there's need. He's attracted. He's actually drawn to these things. He's, he's drawn, the one that shocked me the most, well, let me give you one more. It says he's drawn to mourning. Those who mourn will be comforted. One of his names is comforter. So he's actually, it's, it's not that he doesn't like rejoicing in joy, because we find the bulk of Scripture would address that, but he's, he's actually drawn, he's attracted to mourning, because that's a place where he can bring great comfort. But the one that shocks me the most is he's actually drawn to sin. He doesn't applaud it, he does not approve it, but he's not intimidated by it. He's not intimidated by sin. Where sin abounds, grace, who's the giver of grace? He is. Where grace much more abounds. He is there. And what we've been finding is some of the darkest places in the earth where we put people to minister the gospel is where we have the greatest breakthroughs, the greatest stories, the most outrageous displays of his power, of his glory happen in these dark, dark hell holes of the earth. Why? Because God's not nervous about sin. He's actually attracted to them to display something that everyone there would actually value and appreciate. So here, here is the Lord who is drawn to things that we think aren't okay. And he actually is drawn to bring comfort, to bring righteousness in the place of sin, to give the gift of repentance, to bring strength where there's weakness, to give faith where there's lack. I'm going to give you a story today out of Judges chapter 20. I love the book of Judges. Judges has probably about 50% of the Bible's weirdest stories are in Judges. The, 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 the weirdest stories in the Bible are in Judges, I'm telling you. If you haven't read it lately, read it and just get ready to ask God a lot of questions because Judges is just out there. I, I like the stories that are hard to teach from. Because sometimes you don't need to teach, you just need to read. And this is one of those that it's re perhaps is the reason I only have one point. <laughs> it's just a weird story. It's a weird one. Let me give you the context. Twelve tribes in Israel. The tribe of Benjamin abused, sexually abused raped, murdered a woman without repentance. And so the other 11 tribes went to war with them to purge that kind of sin from their nation. And so I want you to open to Judges chapter 20, and we're going to read this story. We've got about 11, 12 verses to read. So um, if you would just read with me, and then uh, we will get to the point, all right? Verse 18 is where we're going to start. Then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. And they said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? The Lord said, Judah first. Judah means praise. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight <clears throat> excuse me, against them at Gibeah. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and on that day cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. And the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed in battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked counsel of the Lord saying, Shall I again draw near for the battle against the children of my brother Benjamin? And the Lord said, 
go up against them. So the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day. And Benjamin went out against them from Gibeah on the second day and cut down to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Then the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. This is a, a somewhat of a strange story because God actually led Israel into two wars that they lost. There's no rebuke. Other times uh, when Israel went up against Ai in the book of Joshua, we see that there was sin in the camp and that was the reason for the loss. Countless times throughout scripture, we see conflict, we see battle, we see loss, we see the Lord bringing correction. But in this particular situation, they ask God, do we go up against our brother Benjamin? Who do we send first? And God said, send Judah first. In the first chapter of Judges, you'll see where Israel sent Judah first. Judah means praise. The word means praise. That we, we lead into battle through praise because spiritual warfare for us is not devil-focused. It's God-focused. That's why it begins in the context of prayer. Other places in Scripture we see where God actually would send a choir out first because the ministry to the Lord was the context for victory and for triumph. But here they ask the Lord, they say, who goes up first? And God says, Judah goes up first. And they go, cool. So they send Judah up first. They do everything he said to do. And 22,000 men of Israel died. So they come back. They strengthen themselves. They get before the Lord. They weep before the Lord. They say, God, do we go up again? And God says, go up again. They go out again. And this time, 18,000 men of Israel died. And they come back. And once again, there's no correction. There's no sin identified. Nothing has changed. They come back before the Lord once again and they say, God, do we go up again or do we stop this time? And God said, go up again. This time I'll give them into your hand. Here's the one point. We usually count victory by confronting and changing circumstances that we're facing. God counts victory when you pray again after loss. There was defeat. There wasn't accusation of God. There wasn't the refusal to pray. And neither was there the refusal to obey. They lost 40,000 men in two days battle. And yet again the third day, they were willing and ready to go out to battle again, even though it could mean personal loss. We usually define victory by the changing of outward circumstances. And ultimately that is always the focus. But the Lord is building a people that can contain his will, his purposes. I'm not prepared to develop this thought uh, today. Um, actually, I went into it more first service than I had planned to, but it was only because of the huge question marks I left on people's faces. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so let me take a few minutes for this. The will of God is multidimensional. We know the ultimate will of God for our life is on earth as it is in heaven. It's the all-encompassing promise and command of the Lord that it should be here as it is there. That cannot be diminished. It cannot be put into a different period of time. It is the mandate given to every follower of Jesus Christ on earth as it is in heaven. That's the ultimate level of the will of God. But the will of God is dimensional in that the level of the will of God that you and I will enjoy in life is usually determined by what we've become. Why? I'm glad you asked. 
When the will, will of God, first of all, would you agree with me that the will of God done on the earth requires miracles to be demonstrated? There's no other way, right? There's got to be deliverance of torment. There's got to be the changing of the human life from a nature of sin to a nature of righteousness. There's got to be the healing of disease, all these things, the healing of governments, everything that's included in this promise, that which exists there is supposed to exist here. And so we have this this realm that God is wanting to release over people's lives here, but it requires a miracle. What happens when there's a miracle? In John 2 verse 11, after Jesus turned the water to wine, it says, and these signs Jesus did manifesting his glory. Every miracle brings the release of glory. Glory is the word weight, heavy. It's the weightiness of God. It's the weightiness of his person, his covenant, his presence, his manifested glory that is released every time there's a miracle. What happens when the weightiness of God falls upon a people that don't have the character to maintain that weightiness? That which was released to bless actually destroys. And God in his mercy actually veils himself for our sake, not because he is withholding himself. Every delayed answer in prayer is only gaining interest. When the Lord says no, it's only because a better yes is coming. He's always positioning us. When he says wait, it's because he's building the capacity of the prayer to survive the answer. Why does the Lord discipline his people? It's never punishment. It's only so that his blessings don't kill us. He wants a pe- what does he say in John 16? He says, he says in John 16, he says, he says, I have so many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You don't have the weight carrying capacity to stand under that which would be released if I told you everything was in my heart. What's the connection? The connection is whenever God speaks, he releases reality. Never does he simply speak words. He said, my word is to you My word to you is spirit and life. My word to you is spirit. When I speak to you, he says, the Holy Spirit is released who contains the realm of the kingdom and he comes and he ministers life. The weightiness of God is released into the environment every time God speaks. So Jesus says, I have so many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You don't have the weight carrying capacity to live under the reality that I want you to live under. So what does he do? He gives us glimpses. He gives us taste. He gives us breakthroughs here and breakthroughs there to draw our hearts into an affection for the one who works wonders. Creating in us a capacity to live under and to carry the realm, the measure, the dimension of his presence, of his glory that he really longs for everybody. It's out of his mercy that he withholds himself. It's in his mercy that he gives to us in measure. I, I've, I've, noticed, I've noticed through the years, and I, I've, I know I've talked to you about this a number of times even in this last year, but he often answers a prayer, big prayers especially, in seed form. Instead of giving us the oak tree we asked for, he gives us the acorn. He gives us something that we actually have to steward so that it becomes all that we asked for. And in the stewarding of the seed is the strength and character developed that can actually manage the full answer when it's manifest. God is much more devoted to the process than he is to the outcome, as valuable as the outcome is. It's the process that shapes us. And so we have this bizarre story where God actually leads Israel into war twice where they lost. And he considered it a victory. Because after loss, they still came back before him and asked, do we go again? And some of you have faced horrendous situations simply because you did what you thought God told you to do. Some of you have gotten into real crises, real tough situations. Some of the time, the Lord actually gave you the direction. And some of you, it wasn't him, but he can cover that. How many have done stupid things thinking it was him? Yep. (laughs) <laughs> you 
Yes, Chris, I'm, I feel your pain. I, I'm there with you. Yeah, we all have. But here's the deal. The Lord leads us into things. And some of you have suffered such shipwreck and you thought you missed God. And I'm here to tell you, guess what? He's going to honor you because you prayed again. He sees, he sees the victory that even though it didn't work out the way you thought it should or would, it's not over because you're still breathing. It's not over. And I actually was praying into today. I, I actually had this on my heart for a while, as, as simple and brief as it is. I had this thing on my heart for a while because I've, I've been praying into believing that God was actually going to release a word, a promise, an anointing for breakthrough, where there's going to be a number of people in this room that will experience a breakthrough today. Today it comes. Today it comes. And that the Lord is going to reverse the effects of things. Some of you that you did exactly what he said, but the out, how many of you have done things that you know he told you to do and the outcome wasn't anywhere close to what you thought it should be? What you thought it would be. All right. Then you're at the right place. I'm glad you showed up because I, I, I honestly believe that the Lord is going to reverse the effects of many, many, many of those situations today. When we say, when I say that the will of God, let's look at the will of God this way. What's the bottom, the lowest level of the will of God? The Bible says the soul that sins shall die. Now we know, since he added definition to that, he takes no pleasure in the death of the unrighteous. He longs for everyone to come to the knowledge of Christ. He wants everyone to be born again. Are you with me? But this is the base level, the soul that sins shall die, the ultimate level on earth as it is in heaven. And the measure that you and I get to live with is demonstrated by who we've become. It's the process. It's the process that after it doesn't work, you pray again. After it doesn't work, you're still willing to obey. Why is that important? Well, think about it this way. Remember Romans chapter 8? Of course you do. You remember the entire thing. <laughs> every word. That's every single word. And a test will be given at the end of this message to see. Because we won't let you out of here unless you, you know. All things work together for good. Why is that verse even in there if everything works perfect all the time? Verse is completely unnecessary. The verse is only there because we are in process. It's, it's, it's the back, in baseball, it's the backstop behind the, the catcher who's catching the ball. If there's a pass ball, there's something to stop it. That's it right there. All things work together for good. It catches, it catches stray pitches. It catches circumstances that we have no explanation for. Hell, I don't know how that got past me, but all things work together for good. We're going to pray, and I have felt uh, in coming into today that uh, a good part of why we were together was to change people's season. Love it. Yep. It's Christmas for everyone. But I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a real good seasonal preacher, so. You have to realize it's also Christmas in January. <laughs> Just may not be as many gifts. <laughs> it's also Christmas in February. It's the season of the Lord. It is literally the season of God's favor. Yeah. Let, let me throw in one of the challenges that we have. Is when the season, the Jubilee season. In fact, I, I've had two people here several weeks ago. We prayed about the release of debt. You remember that? That Jubilee season, that Jubilee promise. I've had two people come to me who had testified that within the last, I guess it would be the last month, they've been released of, one was 250,000, another was 300,000. Two people, just those two, over a half million dollars, just literally, miraculously, sovereignly taken care of and settled, just out of nowhere. 
Did you hear me? Out of nowhere. Actually, it was out of somewhere, but it was nowhere. Yeah. So when we announce Jubilee, have you ever noticed that what you need, your neighbor gets? Isn't that fun? Nobody's ever noticed that? You're in desperate need of a car, and the person who, get, who has, already has two cars walks into the grocery store, is the millionth customer, and wins a brand new car, another one. Have you ever noticed? That's just the way it works. <laughs> because if I can't rejoice in somebody else's breakthrough, I'm not qualified for my own. So here we are. I believe that the Lord is going to work a miracle into people's lives. I know we got folks watching on TV, and uh, this one's available for you too. Here's what I'm looking for. Anyone in the room that took a bold step in Jesus, you did what he said to do, and you're in a mess right now that can only be fixed by a miracle. That's you, stand up. You did what he said. You went to battle, and 22,000 men died. And you got up and you said, all right, I'll go again. And you did. And this time there was a loss of 18,000. And we're now at the third day. Third day is a significant day in Scripture. Third day. We're at the third day. We're at the day of resurrection. We're at the day of the release of promise. We're at the day when the impossible bends its knee to the name Jesus. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying, Bob. Help me out here. All right, church family, these are our loved ones. Stand around them and pray. I want you to pray boldly. No timid prayers today. Save that for Starbucks. I want you to pray boldly. I want you to pray for breakthrough. A mantle of breakthrough to come upon them. That God will release the full effect of Jubilee. The resurrection of the third day would be released over every single person, every household. Declare promise over them. The promise of the Lord. The promise of the Lord. Pray prophetically over them. Listen to what God is saying. Give them specific promises. You know what to do. Give them specific words. Openly vindicate, we pray. Openly vindicate. You who keep records of secret obedience, we pray. Openly vindicate. These who prayed once again, openly vindicate, openly supply, openly restore. Yeah, share some sort of a prophetic word over them. Just release the word of promise. That's right. The all-sufficient one has the last say in every matter. The all-sufficient one. The one who never lies. He doesn't tease. He draws us into fullness. Thank you, Lord God. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. We announce jubilee. Jubilee over you. Jubilee. Jubilee. Just take one more minute to pray. One more minute. Lord God, we pray for answers with interest. Release answers with interest. Let the bonus round begin. Let the bonus round begin. God is never the one to just make do. 
He's not the caregiver of an orphanage just taking care of basic needs. He is a father who delights, who delights in his children. We pray for this season to be a season of full realization of the goodness and the greatness of the all-sufficient one, our Father. Thank you, Lord. Now we're going to read something together. I, you can go ahead and sit down for a moment just because just I know some of you need to sit. But don't get too comfortable because I'll have you standing in a moment. We're going to read the offering reading we did earlier. And let me tell you why. I, Paul said in Corinthians, he said, first the natural, then the spiritual. Say that with me. First the natural, then the spiritual. What is he saying? The Lord uses natural things, natural realms, natural elements to teach us about spiritual realities. There's an unusual connection. And although money is never the focus of the Christian life, ever, 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 Jesus frequently used it because it's measurable. It's so easy to use the subject of finances to illustrate the kingdom because it is measurable. You know what you have when there's increase. You know, what you, you know what's been increased. It's very easy to measure. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read the same offering reading we read earlier, offering reading number one. And the reason is I want us to target things in the natural. I, I realize the spiritual reality is the great blessing. But I feel like we're supposed to target stuff together. No unemployment in this house. Nobody else loses their home to foreclosure. No, any, all, all the junk that's been in the last, uh, last few years uh, across our country. No more, no more. I, it's, uh, somebody told us years ago, they came here and they said, what you tolerate will dominate. Well, how many are tired of tolerating and want no more dominating of uh, some of these issues? So we're going to read this, and I want you to read it with great boldness and great faith, and we're going to let this actually represent something to us about an ongoing, sustained breakthrough. I love, I love breakthrough, but I've been most interested in sustained breakthrough. And the Lord has given us sustained breakthrough. I remember when the miracles first started happening here, it was, we had them every week. And then we brought Randy Clark in. And they went from every week to every day, and they've been every day since then. And that's been about 15 years ago, every day, daily, daily. Just can't count them, can't count them. That's what I want to see economically. That's what I want to see socially. That's what I want to see in the restoration of houses, family homes, families, family lines, the full restoration of all that God has promised. Why? Because it is his full intention. He is 100% backing his word on earth as it is in heaven. Don't let anyone pull you from the full blessing and responsibility of that promise. Amen. Amen. It's a good point, Bill. Very good. All right, why don't you stand? We're going to read this. And this time, let's read it with a little bit more gusto than, uh, than would be our normal gusto. All right. You know what, why don't we do this while, uh, while I have you standing. I want to have ministry team come to the front real quick and line up along the front. If you do that before we actually read, I'll let you turn your head towards the screen if you need to. But how many of you have this memorized, possibly even backwards by now? Yeah, I, I, not backwards, but I can do it sideways. All right, yeah, ministry team, come on down. And uh, there will be, uh, once again, miracles in people's bodies, uh, some of you have very specific things in your family line that needs to change. Some of you came into the room today uh, with great burden because of a crisis in your family line. There's someone here who needs a miracle and it's connected to tar scar tissue. There's an issue with scar tissue that is actually preventing something from happening that's supposed to happen that's right in your body. And, uh, and as we've seen before, the Lord is dissolving scar tissue. I would encourage you to come and just receive uh, just a, a moment of prayer from, from folks. Uh, cancer, it's normal for cancer to dissolve. We declare once again, this is a cancer-free zone. 
It is not tolerated. We stand together against that. In Jesus' name, if you're here as a guest needing that miracle, please make sure you get up here. But before we do that, I want us to do jobs and better jobs, all right? So are you guys ready? I want to uh, stir. This is Christmas. I want you to pretend like you got your Santa hat on. Rudolph is in front of you, and it's time to throw out the blessings, all right? So let's, let's read. Uh, you know what? I love Christmas, and I'm not even offended at Santa anymore. I used to be. I used to have a hard time with it. It's, it's either, well, never mind. I, I, I'm, I'm good with him too, you know? I'm good with him too. I, I'm, I, it might be because I have grandkids. It might be because I have grandkids. I don't know what it is, but it's, it's all working for me. All right, let's make this decree together. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decreased, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Lift up just a shout of praise to the Lord. We, we bless your great name, God. You're an awesome God. You're a mighty God. You're worthy of all honor, worthy of all praise. We boast in you, God. Yeah, do that one again. Lift up a shout of praise. We magnify you. We boast in you. You're a wonderful Savior, wonderful God. Glorious Lord. Glorious Lord. <laughs> worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord. Yeah. That was a real good tithe. I think we ought to now give him an offering. Perfect in every way. Glorious Lord. Glorious God. Glorious Lord. Glorious Lord. Glorious Lord. Faithful and true. Faithful and true. Mighty, mighty, mighty is the Lord. Mighty is the Lord. Mighty is the Lord. Quick to say. Quick to say. Quick to say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just, we just had to send Jude out first. There's, I know there's folks in the room that just need to get right with God. You maybe don't know the Lord. You maybe have never walked with the Lord at all. We've got a, uh, it'll be up in a moment, uh, what we call a freedom banner. We've got a team of people over here. They can be trusted. They'll love you well. And I'd love for them to be able to pray for you. If you have a friend here that just needs the encouragement, walk down with them and take them over to this part of the room. And we've got a team that will minister to them. If you need a miracle in your body, this is a great day to get healed. Doesn't matter what it is, what it is. Jesus is in a good mood. He sees the end from the beginning. He's quite confident in his plan. And you and I are part of it. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.